Hi, Savannah. Hi, Ryan. What are we talking about today? Today, we are talking about NFTs. Quick shout out to all of our sponsors out there. Thank you so much. We couldn't do this without you, our patrons, um, and of course, our mysterious uh, sponsor, donor, backer, whoever you want to call uh, them. Uh, thank you to you in particular. Um, if you would also like to be a mysterious anonymous sponsor, go ahead, contact us. Our email is in the description and all of our stuff. You also don't have to be anonymous as a sponsor. We will actually read <laughs> your sponsorship as well if you want that too. <laughs> all right, so today we are tackling NFTs. And first, before we really go into them at all, I would just like to firstly state that Ryan and I are not experts by any means. <laughs> if you're wanting to learn more so about like all the intricacies of blockchain and what NFTs are, there's a million other YouTube videos that you can watch for that. So this is not the place necessarily for education <laughs> on the subject of NFTs. So just to get that out of the way. We are also not advising anybody make any type of financial investments on this channel. <laughs> not now or ever <laughs> will we be doing that. So NFT, what is that? Yeah, Savannah, <laughs> what is an NFT? Because <laughs> I only see it in my Google recommended articles, um, like in, in like the title. Um, and I don't really actually click on those articles. So if you would please explain what an NFT is. I will, I will tell you from my understanding and what I've Googled on the internet. So the actual definition of what it is, is an NFT is a non-fungible token. It is a unit of data stored on a digital ledger called a blockchain that certifies a digital asset to be unique and therefore not interchangeable. That was a little confusing. We'll break that down in a second, uh, but I'll continue on <laughs> with this definition. NFTs can be used to represent items such as photos, videos, audio, and other types of digital files. Access to any copy of the original file, however, is not restricted to the buyer of the NFT. While copies of these digital items are available to anyone to obtain, NFTs are tracked on blockchains to provide the owner with a proof of ownership that is separate from copyright. The first part to kind of break down what all of that just meant, let's first just handle the word fungible because when I first heard that word, I was like, that doesn't sound like a real word, um, but it is a real word. <laughs> and this is what fungible or fungibility means. It's the ability to replace or be replaced by another identical item mutually interchangeable. An example of this would be if you have five $1 bills and one $5 bill, those things are interchangeable. Like they will equal the exact same thing. That is the fungibility of them, their ability to be the same. Something that is non-fungible like an NFT is something like, like the Mona Lisa. Like there's only one, there's only ever going to be one and it is not equal to anything else. There can be like approximations of monetary value that can be placed onto it to equal something, but it's something that like the item itself cannot be like replicated in any way. Does that make sense, Ryan? <laughs> yes, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> so the next thing to kind of break down with all of that is blockchain. So again, not an expert, but I will do my best to tell you what blockchain is. Blockchain is a growing list of records called blocks. They are linked together using cryptography. Each block contains a cryptographic hash of the previous block, a timestamp, a transaction data, generally represented as a Merkle tree. The timestamp proves that the transaction data existed when the block was published in order to get into its hash. So again, lots of silly words there <laughs> of blocks and hash, but basically my understanding is that it is like a way of transactions and data of this nature to like get to where it needs to go and to have like a record of how it got there and when it got there. I don't know, Ryan, if you have any other ways of explaining blockchain. <laughs> no, I'm already yawning because I'm so bored. <laughs> All of this is gonna make sense. If you still don't know why we're even talking about it, it'll make sense in a little bit, we promise. <laughs> kind of back to this 
thing, the NFT, the non-fungible token. So almost anything that is digital could be a NFT. So specifically, we're gonna be looking at some like digital artwork that are NFTs, but a song could be an NFT, an article could be an NFT, literally like anything really uh, that can be shared over the internet can be an NFT. And there have been actually some instances of some people and brands trying to branch the physical world with the internet world as well, with trying to like co-mingle physical objects as well with digital objects. So it isn't even necessarily limited to just the internet world. These are things that can be kind of viewed as like collectible type items or like high investments like fine art. It really ranges. A little bit of the history behind this just very, very briefly. In 2014, Counterparty, a peer-to-peer -peer financial platform, was founded and built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain and attracted various projects, including trading card games and meme trading in the following years. The first NFT ever created was titled Quantum, and it was made by Anil Dash and Kevin McCoy, and this was created in 2014, and it depicted a video of a set of spinning dollar symbols set inside of a picture frame. And this was valued at $7 million. So we're talking big money <laughs> with a lot of these things that are selling online. The NFT market has grown rapidly and I'm talking rapidly in the past couple of years, mainly really in the past couple of months. Um, but in 2020, like the growth of the value within the NFT market was tripling to a point of being $250 million. And in the first three months of 2021 alone, there's been more than $200 million spent on NFTs. We actually sort of, well, we didn't touch on NFTs in a prior episode, but when we talked about Feels Good Man, we did not talk about the part of the documentary that did kind of talk about NFTs in a way uh, with a rare Pepe situation. Um, but that, that Pepe, if you've seen Feels Good Man, that Pepe, that that, awful guy, <laughs> kind of, at least seemingly awful to me, uh, who had his car and I think it was like a Lamborghini and his rare Pepe who was vaping. Um, that rare Pepe that he had, he just sold it in March, 2021 as an NFT and it like tripled in price, basically. He had bought it for $38,500 and then it tripled in price from there. Um, so we have sort of talked about it before, but not quite. Now that we have all of that background out of the way, Ryan, I know you kind of said that you mentioned like this is the thing that you see in Google articles that you don't read. I also think it's kind of funny we're talking about NFTs today when last week in our previous episode you were going on about how your least favorite thing to talk to people about were stocks and I feel like this is kind of <laughs> like stocks adjacent. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, I suppose we could be passionate about art. Um, I'm one of those people that I really don't like to buy luxury items for the sake of luxury, except for like some things like makeup, I will buy luxury. Um, so to me, fine art is like the epitome of wasted money. And I know that might be wrong. And I don't know, I, I've never really done any research to formulate this opinion. But I feel like if you have that much money to spend, you should be spending it somewhere else. And it just kind of makes me uncomfortable and like blows my mind that people would spend this much money <laughs> on, on something not even tangible. You know, I think like the most luxurious items that I buy are like special edition collector's items of like games or books or what have you. But at least that's like tangible and has extra content associated with it, whether it be the album, the music. But with this, I, I feel like I'm in an episode of Black Mirror and it makes me feel like the most like old school millennial that I feel like I've ever felt in my life. <laughs> well, I think that perhaps with some of these types of NFTs we will get into, you might have maybe have some more interest in them, <laughs> albeit they are not physical items. I think generally I'm kind of the same, like I don't own luxury items really. <laughs> I guess probably similarly, if I'm buying luxury something, it would be makeup or food, <laughs> luxury food, I feel like I would buy. Um, but I, as somebody who has worked in the art world, albeit I haven't worked with artwork that is millions of dollars, but I have worked with artwork that is hundreds of thousands of dollars 
and I can understand, I guess, that world a little bit <laughs> and somewhat be supportive of it if it is like actually helping people, helping artists to become successful and pay off their student loans <laughs> that might cost that much money. Um, but <laughs> I like actually I came to learning about NFTs through the art world and seeing some like kind of memes sprinkled around talking about them. And then I was like, oh, what is this? I should look into this if other people are talking about it. Um, so that was kind of my introduction to them. But like other than like your random articles you'd see here and there, Ryan, have you like come into contact with NFTs in any other way? No, no, I have not. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> so actually, really what brought me to the idea of having this particular podcast was because a couple weeks ago, I was watching the Hot Ones episode that Paris Hilton was on. <laughs> and in that, mm. she was talking about like the artwork that she'd been making lately. And she was asked like, oh, what's your favorite artwork that you've made? And she said it was the NFT that she was working on that was going to be exhibited at Art Basel. And when I saw that, I was like, what is this? <laughs> like I wasn't, I didn't know what NFT was really, but I knew what Art Basel was. And Art Basel is a like huge art festival here in the United States in Miami, massive, like in the global art industry. So I was like, what is Paris Hilton doing there? So then I Googled NFTs and then I saw that Paris Hilton made them. And a lot of other just like celebrities and pop culture icons have also been making them. And I was like, oh, that's so, interesting and something I would like to explore and I thought maybe our listeners would also be interested in since we like to talk about pop culture and politics here at PPP. <laughs> <laughs> if you recall back to our Mandalorian episode when we were looking at the Thomas Kincaid paintings of the Mandalorian, we kind of would look at some of the paintings and then just kind of talk about them. We did specifically like a visual analysis of those paintings. Today we're gonna do something a little similar where we're gonna look at some NFTs, but we're not really necessarily gonna analyze them. I think it'd just be kind of more interesting just to look at them and give our general opinions about them and maybe talk a little bit about maybe why we think this person would choose to make an NFT and to try to break into this industry. All right, what's up first, Savannah? First, we are going to look at Paris Hilton's NFT. She has quite a few that she released, I believe last week. Right now, um, it is April 27th, today, 2021. So first we are going to look at Paris Hilton's. You know, for all that I just said about NFTs, I'm looking at this Paris Hilton uh, masterpiece artwork here. And I do instantly feel serotonin just enter my brain. I am immediately relaxed and I feel happy. So I guess I would pay some amount of money to own this. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Ryan. <laughs> so this uh, NFT is in fact not made by Paris Hilton herself. She did work with another artist to create this whose name is Blake Catherine. And I saw on her Instagram Paris Hilton, when she posted when these were going live or there was a drop happening of her NFTs, I believe she described this as being her like getaway in her mind when she's facing all like the troubles of the real world and the pressures of society. Like this is her magical space that she would want to go to to get away from it all. This piece is called uh, Bedroom Bliss and it is very blissful and it is a bedroom. Um, it has like one of those round beds surrounded by a pool of water it looks like and then some natural scenery around. Um, and then there's like a sailor moon moon in, in the background kind of off in the distance in the sky. There's a classy chandelier that's rotating around and greyhound statues. So that, that instantly, of course, brings me peace. <laughs> and it does have sound. If you press play on it, it has kind of like a lo-fi hip hop, kind of like chill beat to the background, which I would imagine, Ryan, you said something like in a podcast earlier, or maybe you just said it to me that your like dream in life is just to like, lounge in bed all day reading. I feel like this could be mm -hmm. a great place for that. <laughs> <laughs> it would, it would be, it looks very relaxing. It looks like I'd still get my vitamin D rays um, because of the open floor plan. Uh, and 
Like I said, this looks incredibly dreamy and beautiful to me. I, I really um admire this piece of work right here. I don't know what I'd do with it. Like, what do you do with these things? Um, you didn't really explain that. Like, are they a screensaver? Uh, do I put it on my phone? Like, what is the tangible value in owning this? Like, when, when am I looking at this, you know? Like, at least with fine art, traditional fine art, I can, I suppose, kind of imagine appreciating having it in my house and looking at it, I guess. Um, but with this, like, what, 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 what do I get out of it? Besides it increasing in value, maybe. So it is kind of complicated. So the thing with these is that obviously we are looking at it and experiencing this even though we didn't buy it. This edition last sold for $1,111. So we didn't pay that to see it. We're looking at it for free on the internet. The person who purchased this, it's kind of unclear. Like it seems like each NFT has its own different rights essentially. Like the artist in Paris Hilton, they still own the copyright to this image. This person, however, might get special clearance essentially to post it on their social media or if this were a still image, they could use it as their profile picture or something of that nature. Honestly, a lot of it just comes down to it being like a flex, <laughs> it seems like for people, for them to be like, I own Paris Hilton's NFT and you don't. <laughs> I think that is really a big selling point. Um, and then again, just like the investment that is projected that these things are going to increase in value that they can then like flip for a higher profit, essentially like you would with stocks or fine art, something like that. So it's a little loose. I mean, even if somebody wanted to use this as their profile picture and that's what they get as like their special thing, I can also just screenshot this and use it as my profile picture too. <laughs> and there isn't really anything stopping that from happening. So it definitely is a little bit of a wild west situation <laughs> of people not really knowing for sure what they are doing but it seems like a lot of people have faith that this is going to at least make them money in some way. Like they will return on their investment. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I guess not, no, but I mean, <laughs> it answers it to the best of humanity's ability, I guess. <laughs> I know it's at least not the answer that you'd want because it's not like clear or defined <laughs> on what is actually the benefit of this. Mm -hmm. I, I see later on this outline, just as a teaser for all of you, that there are some tangible kind of benefits that uh, stores and brands are using, I think, that make more sense to me. Um, but just in general, I guess owning one of these doesn't make sense. Um, but anyways, any last comments on uh, bedroom bliss? No, other than I wish I could live there. I wish that was my home. <laughs> Uh, so the next one we're pulling up is going to be by Grimes X. So collaborating with Mac. Uh, it's called Newborn Number Two. Newborn Two, number 17 out of 100. I guess there's 100 newborns. So I believe, so this is like in a series. She has some other ones that are similar to this demon angel baby. And I believe the number 17 out of 100 is that some NFTs are like, within an edition, there will be like 50 available within the edition. Oh, five. I see. So this probably see, had 100 and this is number 17. And it's interesting because as of right now, um, as we're recording in late April, um, this one last sold for $20, but it's now on sale for $25,000. Um, and it's a uh, picture of, it feels wrong to say an anthropomorphized baby because like babies are anthropomorphic but it's like a an adult like baby <laughs> with angel wings and red eyes um and it's standing at one of the stand-up microphones um this does not bring me instant serotonin <laughs> or bliss what what does it bring you um it brings me i don't know it just feels like very off-brand for me like, it's not weird enough to where I feel like I would want it, but it's it's like that weird, it's a weird where it's like a common weird. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not super enthused by this. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's a stand-up microphone or like a scepter that the baby is holding. 
Uh, I can't really tell. Um, but yeah, this one, I find Grimes is to be a little off-putting to look at. Um, she has really made a splash. She has been one of the biggest people who has made quite a bit of money on selling a lot of entities. Like she seems like she's really put her full force behind this and believing in this industry, which is kind of on brand for her, I feel like, <laughs> to be trying to do uh, things like that. Good for her. Good for her. <laughs> she has several others uh, that are, like I said, also demon angel babies and it's strange babies. Maybe she did just have a baby. <laughs> so perhaps that might be why uh, there are all these demon babies. I hope her baby isn't a demon baby. But yes, so this is one of Grimes's. There's not a whole lot to say about it. I mostly picked this one because of the fact that she is one of these people who has been a almost like innovator, I guess, if you will, in this budding industry. So now we are going to look at one by The Weekend. It is titled Artifact 001. And it looks like it is number 119 out of 17, what? 1,007, what am I saying? 1,749. This edition last sold for $333 and it is now on sale for $600. So not quite as expensive as the others at this point in time, but it has doubled in price just about. And the other artist he, The Weeknd, collaborated with is Strange Loop Studios. And so this particular piece is a animated video of what looks like The Weeknd's face. Uh, just like his face, kind of like lean back. And it looks almost like there's like, he's made me, maybe made out of like stone or something with like cracks in it. And it has a like red glow to it with like a light that is kind of like going over his face it has like those like red purple blue kind of colors that you see in a lot of music videos that he has and the sound was it one of his songs in the background in particular or was it just him singing? no i think it's just i think <laughs> in the description it says original sound by the weekend um yeah. so i think it's just kind of what you would imagine an interlude to sound like on the most recent album, which name is escaping me, unfortunately. I don't know. It wasn't nominated for a Grammy, so it can't be important, right? <laughs> this one, it is about a minute long as well. So this one was longer than the Paris Hilton video one. Mm -hmm, which was just on a loop for the most part. Like it yeah. felt like it was on a loop. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on this one, Ryan? Uh, it feels very on brand for the weekend. In all honesty, I think that's all I can get behind um, is that it just feels on brand. It feels like if I were to purchase this, I would be purchasing something that the weekend would have had a hand in. And um, I, I think that's all I can say for it. It doesn't bring me any particular kind of feeling other than I did enjoy the weekend's album. So I kind of enjoyed the visuals here. But other than that, that's it, I guess. Yeah, I think I agree. Like I said, like it fits right in with his music videos and his color scheme that he tends to have. He has a type of personality where it makes sense to me that he would like be in this kind of market as well of just making like, we're putting out like kind of maybe not your typical digital media to consume. So the next one that we're going to look at is uh, Stay Free. Um, Edward Snowden, 2021, and the description reads, this unique signed work combines the entirety of a landmark court decision ruling the National Security Agency's mass surveillance violated the law, with the iconic portrait of the whistleblowers by Platten used with permission. It is the only known NFT produced by Snowden. And uh, it's expensive. <laughs> it is. It sold for... 2,224 ETH, which is $5,988,231.20. So very expensive. <laughs> not in my budget. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And it looks like it's just the court decision just all cut up and rearranged to look like the iconic Edward Snowden face portrait that I'm sure comes to mind when you think of Edward Snowden. And I picked this one um, just because I thought it was interesting to see somebody else who maybe isn't your typical celebrity. Edward Snowden is more so a celebrity activist, I guess you could say, if you want to call him that. Um, 
I like Edward Snowden. <laughs> I think he's cool. He's a celebrity to me. The money from this piece was donated. The auction was on behalf of the Freedom of the Press Foundation. Thoughts on this one, Ryan? <laughs> I don't think I have any thoughts. It feels pretty mindless to me. It feels, um, yeah, it, it feels pretty like we need to cater and, and say something. Let's just do something understated. Okay, what about the court case decision with face? Great. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that it is um, like necessarily very like visually interesting to look at. In fact, I wish it was like more easy to actually see his face. <laughs> like, I don't know why mm -hmm. they couldn't have just made the font like a little bit darker, uh, but it is what it is. <laughs> also kind of as a side, Ryan, for some reason, like in my mind, when I think of your boyfriend, I think of him as like looking like Edward Snowden. <laughs> <laughs> like I think of them sometimes as being interchangeable. If you are listening, I, uh, Ryan's boyfriend, I'm sorry if you find that insulting. I don't mean it to be an insult. <laughs> I don't think you would find it insulting. I think he would take it as a compliment. Okay, good. <laughs> so we are looking now at Will one of William Shatner's NFTs. He has made quite a few. Um, this particular one, I could not find like the specifics on how much it sold for or anything. Uh, but he made several of these kind of like traditional like trading card type style ones, um, which have been becoming popular amongst like other just like general celebrities, like actors, YouTubers, um, lots of people, which kind of like harkens back to maybe like some original concepts of what NFTs could be basically like a digital trading card that is just more limited in quantity, perhaps. I don't know. I just thought it was kind of fun <laughs> that William Shatner was getting in on the game. <laughs> yeah, I know that is kind of fun and weird. Feels, uh, feels on brand as well, though, especially we're looking at this and it's kind of like old timey. It looks like a movie ticket almost. I don't know. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Again, I don't know. <laughs> All of these are just so weird to me. I really do feel like one of those old millennials right now. And I'm technically not. I, I, I think I made the cutoff. I think maybe. Technically, I forget what we're called. We're called, oh, we're called zillennials, technically, Ryan. Did you know that? Mm, I think that's a fake term, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Anyways, yeah, so I'm just, I'm not really understanding. Again, I'm seeing this. It looks like a great GIF. Um, that's all I can say. <laughs> all right, so now we're gonna move on to our like final official one that we are going to look at, which is one of the big ones in the NFT world. This is Beeple, and Beeple is a known digital artist in the contemporary art world. This is Beeple's The First 5,000 Days. He made it this year, and this sold for $69.3 million. And it is one of those pictures that's like, a big picture that's made up of lots of tiny, tiny pictures of all different like digital illustrations, basically. Try to zoom in on it if you're watching it on the video right now so you can see like some different portions of it. But so this one is made by an actual, air quotes, <laughs> contemporary artist like in the industry who is also in like, engaging with this industry as well. So just another end of the spectrum, essentially. So I don't really have a take on this. I am more curious about what your take on this is. Um, I mean, I think it's like not that interesting, <laughs> apart from it perhaps just being like an artifact of the time and it being like, this is one of the ones that was like a big deal uh, and sold at auction, which we'll talk a little bit about more later. Um, but this one seems to have been like recognized by the art world, which I find that as like an artifact to be interesting, but just to be like looking at it, I'm like, all right, like it's cool. I mean, that's how I feel too. When I look at like starry night, <laughs> I don't know. Someone's probably going to come for me for, for that, but <laughs> it's just kind of like, oh, okay. Like that, that's there. <laughs> that, that's how I kind of feel about it. I'm curious if all those images are like original images or if they're like prior artworks of his or modified, I'm just very curious. It says, the work is a collage of 5,000 digital images created by Winkleman, who is Beeple, uh, for his Everyday series. So uh, yes, he did make all of them, all 5,000. And that is pretty cool then. And this is, as I said, it sold for $69.3 million. 
uh, and this is the highest paid price for an NFT and the third most expensive work by a living artist to ever sell. Now that we've seen some NFTs, let's talk a little bit more like about them and maybe the implications of them. So firstly, I think I would like to talk about what their implications are within the just like general art world and maybe get like your thoughts on it, Ryan, maybe if you have any like comparisons to other industries and how other industries have like dealt with change perhaps in this way. I kind of feel like the art world is interesting because it sometimes seems like it adapts really quickly to things and other ways it doesn't adapt quickly and is like really rooted in its ways and doesn't want to accept new things. Um, so I've been seeing kind of like both sides to that with the NFT situation. Can you give like a specific example of that instance? Yeah. Have them either rejecting or moving quickly with the times? Well, I mean, <laughs> there's something like big, like something like institutionalized racism. And that's something that they have moved very slowly with the times uh, to deal with and to address. I think that like generally speaking, like art institutions like museums um, and whatnot, they have been kind of like slow to really like have all of their work online to be viewed or to have like virtual tours of their museums, different things like that. Um, but like, and that's like everything prior to 2020, <laughs> I think that they were kind of slow to adapt to that kind of stuff. But then once the pandemic happened, a lot of institutions moved like really, really fast to immediately like implement all this stuff for people to still engage with them in a virtual setting. Um, Mm -hmm. So that is kind of like a both ways. And I mean, what really led to them finally adapting to like the settings that they needed to for the pandemic, I think was just because they needed to figure out a way to make people still want to give them money, <laughs> which I think is yeah. probably just what would lead them to adapting to NFTs as well. So just some like general like feelings that the art world that I've seen uh, about NFTs, um, just kind of like generally online on like Instagram accounts, I've seen kind of a mix between people being excited about it and having like this new platform that artists can utilize. And I've also seen kind of like a disdain and bitterness for it and almost acting as if like that's not legitimate or a legitimate way to sell your artwork. Only the original way is the legitimate way. And I've seen some memes about this as well, which I will insert here when I um, am editing. You can see these lovely memes. I also kind of already touched on how this might affect art collectors. Um, really, it's just kind of like the same thing as buying other art, either one, like you get to support an artist that you like and you want to support them monetarily, or you can potentially make an investment, um, which is I probably, I don't know. I would guess that probably more people buy fine art for the investment rather than they like it. <laughs> so I would assume that that's probably more so what is happening here as well. Um, and for artists, um, maybe some benefits of NFTs or that they can allow for greater autonomy for the artist. NFT platforms, some of them at least have a feature that you can enable that will pay you as the artist a percentage every time that your NFT is like sold and resold again. Whereas in traditional art markets, say your painting goes up for auction and someone buys it, like you'll get money from that original sale, but then if that person decides to like resell it, you wouldn't get any money from that. Uh, but there's a possibility through this type of block blockchain to retain a percentage of that, which would be, I think, a pretty big deal uh, for a lot of artists because a lot of people lose out on money that they could have had by their artwork increasing in value over time. It also, I think, has the ability to help a lot of artists um, just because in 2020, due to the pandemic, the, it hit the art world pretty, pretty hard. In 2020, the sale of art and antiquities went down 22%, which was the biggest drop since the 2009 uh, recession. So this sudden increase in sales of NFTs has the ability to really put a lot of money into the art market, which would hopefully in theory then help artists. I mean, 
I'm not exactly sure that the trickle down economics would work in that way, <laughs> but in theory, hopefully <laughs> that would help artists. So I'm just kind of curious, Ryan, if you like see maybe any parallels with like other industries, maybe that you have like an interest in and having to like quickly adapt to something like this in some kind of way. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can think of a direct comparison. Like if I think of, like, are you trying to say that like the traditional art world is now trying to compete with NFTs and they're trying to come together or I I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't think like, I think of books, right. And like the publishing industry have to compete with mega stores like Amazon. Um, but like books are still going to exist and and so are like the physical books are going to exist still and they will be printed so i'm not sure i really can't think of anything that is similar that have been digitalized in a similar way besides maybe like hearthstone <laughs> you know or like online card games or online uh, or, or um, I'm not being very articulate. This is the first time I've ever thought of this. Um, <laughs> what, loot boxes where some, where ideally they would all have actual value in trading and like a limited number of. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I can't think of anything that's that's kind of similar that's been translated besides maybe loot boxes and like rare game items. But even those, I'm not sure that there's a limited number of. I would be interested to know if maybe there is some comparable thing within books and like ebooks. Like, you know how like it's rare to get like a first edition, whatever, Catcher in the Rye. Like that would be like worth money because there'd probably only be so many. I wonder mm-hmm. if somebody has made something comparable to that within like ebooks, for example or something you'd get on your Kindle, something like that. Yeah, not that I can think of. I, this does stink, though. I, I'm sure there's going to be some kind of trading card that's going to pop up from NFTs, and we're going to have an online... It's going to be like Pokemon, but in the digital world all over again. Or it's going to be Pokemon, but digitalized all over again, where each Pokemon card is going to have... It's going to be an NFT, and they're all going to be super rare. But that's, that's kind of like the same thing, I would say. I, I don't feel like traditional Pokemon cards would have to compete with online Pokemon cards. I'm not sure. I think that the art world will more than likely like go along with NFTs probably because they won't have a choice. It's so early in the NFT like history (laughs) to say whether or not it will like go on forever. Like for instance, like Bitcoin when Bitcoin first happened, everyone was like, Bitcoin is the way of the future. But here we are in 2020 and you still can't use Bitcoin when like you go to Target. (laughs) That's not to say that cryptocurrency isn't going to work. It just means that like Bitcoin specifically has not made the splash in the market like we thought it would. So a lot of people are projecting that NFTs are going to like probably at least if not take over, become as big of a deal as like physical auctions to go to. Oh, that was something that I forgot to mention. Auction houses are auctioning NFTs. So Christie's is a auction house that opened in 1766 and they're known for auctioning like lots of antiquities, famous paintings, all that stuff. And they've started auctioning NFTs and they're the one who auctioned the Beeple NFT. I think that the people with the money (laughs) seem like they're like getting on board with this. It seems more so like the people who are like, the stick in the mud with like digital art in general that they don't want to like get on board necessarily as quickly. But there's just like a lot of bitterness, I think, in some art communities of people just being upset that they're not as successful as they think they should be. But that's another I am curious (laughs) because earlier you stated that you could justify um, the high cost of buying artwork just like the outrageous cost of buying artwork and that you can justify that within the art community. Um, so I am just curious uh, about that and, and how that translates over to uh, the NFT world now that we live in. Like, do I think it's justifiable for people to spend $69 million on one? Yeah, do you think that's ethical? <laughs> do I think it's ethical? I mean, I think people can do whatever they want with their money <laughs> if they're not hurting anybody. 
I mean, I don't think it's really ethical for there to be millionaires and billionaires. <laughs> so I don't, in that case, I would say no, that it's not ethical. Um, but we live in a world where those people do exist. So they're going to spend their money. I think that probably would be better for them to be spending their money in other philanthropic ways, probably. There are some ethical issues with NFTs, which we'll get into a little bit later with the environmental impact of them, which in itself is a pretty major issue. But I don't see anything wrong with somebody spending that much money on it just because they want to, I guess. Do you think that's wrong? ethically to spend like that much money on it uh I, I feel like the way i phrase the question i mean the answer is yes and i already stated that i am not a person that understands luxury for luxury sake. so uh yes and especially if there's you mentioned earlier as well you feel like most people trade in fine arts for the monetary value not so much for the visual uh, value and uh entertainment so i would say that if you're buying it just for the money that's like an extra like demerit in your soul so that's yeah it just depends like i mean so ryan and i we are setting up an etsy shop <laughs> as um a little surprise to all you guys listening <laughs> we are setting up an etsy shop where we will be reselling items i don't think that there's anything wrong with reselling those items even if it's something that maybe we personally would it like go out and buy, but we know someone else would maybe want to go buy it. Um, that type of exchange, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that exchange. Or are you not saying that that type of exchange is inherently bad? Because it kind of sounded like you were saying that type of exchange is not ethical. No, I'm saying that spending millions of dollars on one piece so that you can hopefully get $3 million later is bad. I, I'm not saying that collectibles for collectibles sake is bad. I think that you can have collectibles and expect for them to go up in value. I mean, we both have had collectibles that we expect to go up in value. I have Pokemon cards that I hope one day will go up in value. But I think at the time I did get some kind of joy out of having all those items and pride in collecting and, and, and not just for the money. Um, and it's on a much smaller scale. <laughs> I think when you really scale it up to the millionaire class, um, it becomes a bit iffy for me. I mean, I think it's a much larger issue of than like people inflating prices that things should not be inflated to and then how that affects like how people like value different artworks. Like someone might think that this artwork that sold for $69 million is so important when actually it isn't necessarily important. Somebody just spent a lot of money on it. I think that can be kind of like, the larger issue, but I don't know. This is, that's a lot <laughs> to unpack there. And I think we should probably move on. <laughs> I like your little section here that you have of uh, mediums crossing over into the NFT world. I kind of talked about how I would imagine how trading card games would go in the future if they were NFT-ified. So I, I kind of like this already, how things are already being used and encrypted. Um, by blockchaining um, to give more value to what you have physically. So if you want to go over those examples, Savannah. So NFTs have kind of really broken into, it seems almost like all mediums at this point, or at least many mediums. Um, for instance, Kings of Leon, they have released an album that was a NFT this year. Video games have instituted different NFT elements. They've used NFTs to represent in-game assets, such as digital plots of land. I know the game Mirandus. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, Ryan. Um, but they mm -hmm. have like auctioned off plots of land within the game. There has been crossover in fashion. I saw one NFT for Gucci while I was doing research for this. Specifically, Nike has really gotten in kind of early, early. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, in 2019, they patented a system called Crypto Kicks that would use NFTs to verify the authenticity of physical sneakers and give a virtual version of the shoe to the customer. And in sports, the NBA also got in relatively early with NBA Top Shot, which is a project to sell tokenized collectibles of NBA highlights, like little videos of people 
shooting the ball, <laughs> making baskets, whatever, whatever the basketball terminology is. <laughs> and then some other quick ones, uh, Kevin Smith has said that his next movie that comes out will be a NFT. Um, there's been some porn that has been tokenized as NFTs. And of course there have been memes that have been sold as NFTs, most notably being Nyan Cat, which sold for just under $600,000. So it's really branching out all over the place and people are trying out all new different possibilities of being able to maybe actually get some other benefit other than just looking at something and being able to flex on people <laughs> for what you have. Yeah, like that all makes sense to me. I think that kind of moving on from that, you're right. I think that the NFT uh, market will open up uh, more investment opportunities for people who might not have investment opportunities on the regular um, other than just like penny stocks. Um, so I think that could be interesting for people moving forward um, to kind of, if they want a, a piece of the market, I don't think it's too late or too early. Not that I'm suggesting anyone to do that. Um, like we said earlier, no one, please <laughs> take any financial advice from us. Yeah. And I think kind of jumping off of that, uh, something that's like, I think interesting specifically like with blockchain is how it has this ability to kind of decentralize things for people. More people could, in theory, get in on investing in this way, whether or not that'll really be possible with all these like millionaires trying to get in on it is yet to be seen. Um, but it definitely seems possible for small people to maybe make money or maybe have some type of platform that they can also utilize in some way. Something that I think is interesting and kind of cool with this as well is it kind of like decentralizes the access to something. Um, so while the owner of the original image or whatever of this NFT is, they will like they own their copy of the image, but it's still able to be viewed in its entirety, like on the computer. So like for instance, like I have this book here, it's like a old digital art book. I can't really see things in the way that they're necessarily meant to be seen in this book because it's on paper versus if something was like meant to be viewed on the screen. Whereas here, if that, with an NFT, if somebody made a digital artwork that is meant to be like seen and heard on a computer with whatever like style it is that they made it in, you can actually like experience the real thing, which we talk about all the time in like art history circles. Like it's a different thing to see Starry Night in person versus to just look at it in the book because there's like texture and all these things that are specific to it being a painting that you're not gonna get from looking at a picture in the book. But with NFTs, you have the ability since we, like we just showed you guys, like you can actually just interact with it and see it even if you didn't buy it. Like anybody will have access to that and have access to like learn from it or take whatever it is that they want out of it. Uh, for their own like education or information, which I think is cool. Good point. Yeah. I was just really thinking about <laughs> Homestuck. I'm sorry. <laughs> about how there's like a whole thing about how to um, like preserve Homestuck because it was originally on MS Paint and Flash. And those are both like gonzo from the universe. And so like it was a big scramble to try to like uh, make Homestuck accessible for later generations. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of it is like gamified, so you can't just like read it. Um, so I, I was just thinking about that. All right, and so now I kind of just want to read this quote to you, Ryan, uh, to see if you have any thoughts on it. I got this quote. I looked at some books today for our podcast. Uh, this quote is from Radical Technologies, The Design of Everyday Life by Adam Greenfield. And this quote says, it suddenly made sense to talk about the secure, verifiable, and transparent movement of any fiduciary token whatsoever across the blockchain from one party to another. More profoundly yet, it presented new ways of thinking about organization itself and what it means to associate with others, how joint intention might be harnessed, and parties unknown to one another yoked in effective collaboration across the usual barriers of space and time. So I'm just curious, Ryan, <laughs> if you have any thoughts about, I guess, like the implications of something like NFTs 
or blockchain and how it will maybe affect the way that we engage with different mediums, whether that be a movie or an album, or how we even just like engage with other people in the procurement of those things. I'm just trying to think about how NFTs can be used against us. Um, I guess is where my mind goes, because I think that quote is rather positive. They have been hacked. There have been some NFTs that have been hacked. Um, so there is that as a negative. Right, right. But I, I'm thinking more about like exclusivity um, or information or hoarding uh, of a way to make NFTs even more exclusive so that they're not accessible to the public. Because I feel like that has to be the next thing coming, right? Probably. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think that begs a larger question of will our blockchain utopia really be as decentralized as people imagine it to be? Or will it just like succumb to just creating another governing authority that will like overrun everything? I think it will succumb more likely to build better echo chambers than we already live in. If hoarding information is kind of the next step for NFT and more exclusivity, um, to only be accessed if you're part of those specific groups. Um, so I think what I mean by echo chamber is just like, like people with like people with like people. Um, and that's what I feel like NFTs could bend towards. I think that's definitely possible. Um, something specific with like blockchain is that it creates people to people transactions versus like a client to a server transaction. Uh, which would, I think, lead to something like that echo chamber that you're describing. That also another potential negative is that can allow for more like illegal illicit activity to happen with like illegal file sharing, since it's not having to go through some regulating body like a server that can look for that kind of stuff. Just anybody can be exchanging things in that way as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I didn't think of that. I don't know. I think we're still really early on even though we're not that early on, I think things will move very quickly. And I'm eager to see if this will continue to take off um, or become more exclusive, um, like I think it will, or not. Maybe it is kind of like an art and investment revolution. I hope it is, um, but only time will tell. So kind of moving on from there, I think that NFTs also bring up questions about just like the credibility of digital art, as well as just like a question of what is art, which is still a question to some people. I, I mean, I guess it's probably a question to a lot of people. I think, like I kind of mentioned before, like some people have been slow to still accept digital art as a art form, uh, which I think would be interesting to you, Ryan, also as a budding digital artist. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> I think that this will probably force a lot of people to contend with it as being legitimate, especially with it being sold at auction houses like Christie's and just going for so much money. And like I mentioned before, people tend to associate large price tags with legitimacy in art. So I think that it'll probably change like the general like attitude towards general art. And I think it'll also like allow for more expansion of what art is. I mean, I'm of the mindset that anything can be art anything at all. Um, so I think that this will probably push more people to both create different things that can be shared digitally online as forms of art and also push people to just think and expand more their conceptions of what art can be. We can hope. I do wonder what museums will look like if NFTs do kind of take over or have their moment, you know? Um, I am very curious if like how NFTs will be given to museums or donated to museums, how they will be displayed, if there will be like full NFT exhibits that are interactive. I have some thoughts on that, Ryan. I'm glad that you asked about it. I think museums probably already are collecting NFTs and if not, they will probably be gifted some very quickly. And I think that it's not gonna be that unusual because I've gone to now several exhibitions at like major art institutions that are focused on digital art and it's not uncommon to just see like screens up on the wall that are displaying artworks in various ways. Um, a particularly interesting case study with this I think is Bill Gates. Now I don't know if this quote is true. I don't even remember where I heard this quote <laughs> but at some <laughs> point in time Somebody told me that Bill Gates stated that he's never going to buy a real painting again because he can always just get like 
the best version of it online. I tried Googling this to see if he actually said that, but I couldn't find anything. However, I did find a interesting article from 1991 <laughs> from Bill Gates, where he actually was talking about how he was investing almost in pre NFTs. He was investing in digital artwork and he was actually buying like digital copies of artworks from museums, things that were not even meant to be digital. He was buying digital copies of paintings and drawings, anything like that that was physical. He was buying the digital copies to have them on display on screens in his home. So I would imagine that people would probably start doing that. Museums would start doing that. I mean, I've already, like I said, I've been to many museums where they have iPads where you can like swipe through different artworks that they weren't just even able to like showcase in the museum setting. I also think it would be a really great opportunity, kind of like I said before, just for museums to showcase their artwork like on their website and have it just be available for like anybody to see if they can't physically go to the museum as well. Which I think also the thing with Bill Gates and him not wanting to buy paintings is just wondering like what would life be like if there was no physicality to things? <laughs> like how would life be different if just suddenly all of our artwork was digital and we couldn't like touch it? I mean, you're not supposed to touch the art <laughs> if you go to a museum, but like in theory you could touch it. You can see that it has like texture. I guess I just kind of wonder like this, there's no answer to this question, but just what, what would it be like if just nothing had that kind of texture? Yeah, I don't think we really have to think too hard <laughs> about that question. <laughs> I think you're posing it as slightly more interesting than it is. Um. <laughs> I think it's interesting, Ryan. <laughs> you don't have to think it's interesting. I do just want to throw one last quote at you uh, in mm -hmm. this section to get your thoughts on it. So this comes from the article, Why We Need a Feminist Manifesta of the Blockchain. This is the quote. They, the blockchain, symbolize a certain way we think about art and the ethics and cultural value that we assign to it and how we humans stand in relationship to the material world. I'm th curious on your thoughts on that, Ryan. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the whole crux of where I am and my kind of uncomfortableness or skepticism. It's like, what are we gonna assign value next? It just doesn't feel like we should be assigning value to something like this when there's like humanity that we have to assign value to. Like, I hate to be that person to be like, you probably shouldn't spend like in my own friend circles, $2,000 on a pair of shoes and you should probably put that somewhere else. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess I'm realizing that I have some, some very skeptical feelings about um, what humans value um, in the material and digital world. And I think I'm, I'm being a bit hypocritical here as well. Um, <laughs> I do purchase luxury items. I do like to look a certain way and present a certain way and like have nice things. Um, so I think there's something to be said there, but I, uh, that's just like how I feel and what I want to say right now. Yeah, I mean, I think I've kind of made it clear where I'm standing, at least currently on the subject. I am just very interested, I think, to see where this is all gonna go and how it might change the way that we relate to either one another as creators and how we relate to the things that people are creating. The last topic that I would like to discuss is the environmental impact of NFTs. NFT purchases and sales are enmeshed in a controversy regarding the high energy use and consequent greenhouse gas emissions from them, which is not like unique to NFTs. This is a large issue just in general with things like Bitcoin mining and uh, blockchain in general. It requires a lot of energy and produces a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. An analogy that's been used to like describe how big of a problem this is, is that the footprint of an NFT is associated with an additional passenger plane, like for any given flight. So that's- That's like, crazy. I didn't know it was that bad. Yeah. So I know that some people have tried to offset this by like allowing people to purchase carbon offsets. Similarly, if you've ever seen, like when you buy a plane ticket with some airlines, you can do that. However, those have often been scrutinized as not even being real uh, to what people think that they're buying. Uh, 
they're not actually doing anything or benefiting anything. Um, and then also some artists have just flat out said, I'm not doing NFTs because of the greenhouse gases. I'm not going to participate in that economy. I mean, I feel like I initially really want to jump on the bandwagon and be like, oh, that's right. You really shouldn't do NFTs, you know? Like, that's the whole reason. It's bad for the environment. Like, I just kind of want to say that just because I'm uncomfortable with NFTs and I don't really appreciate them for what they are and I'm having some difficult time assigning them to any value in the society. So that's what I want to say. Um, but that is crazy. I am curious what the comparison is, though, to, like, um, like the production of, like, a, something paper-based or something like that needed tools like what the production cost of those tools were how that contributed to green gas so i feel like it's not a fair comparison until i know like what it costs for other art pieces to be produced and what their greenhouse emission look like yeah i would definitely like to know too especially because that's been a pretty big topic discussed in the art world recently is just how big of an environmental footprint it leaves behind with all of the like art festivals and fairs that are like around the world everybody traveling to them um, and then the environmental impact of like all of the people like specifically like at the Venice Biennale like the environmental impact of so many people traveling to a very small geographic location um, and then just the transport the physical transport of artworks that go like one artwork could be in India in one day and then New York in a week and then in Beijing the next week and then in Hawaii, like it goes on and on and on. Um, so it's a pretty big problem within the art industry. So I don't know how it relates. I know that it's like, I think with a lot of technology, unfortunately, it seems like this is just kind of like what happens, like even with like the cloud, like cloud servers are not energy efficient at all and cause lots of problems as well. So I don't know, I kind of funnily put on here um, on our outline was like, how will we get out of this labyrinth of suffering <laughs> as tied <laughs> to our previous podcast? Cause I kind of feel like it's sometimes feel like every time we come up with a new like technological advancement, we're like, oh, but the environment, <laughs> like <laughs> we are still suffering in that way and this is just gonna make it worse. So is it really an advancement? I don't know. I don't know either. Um, I mean, if everyone just stayed home all the time and didn't travel, I think that would offset like actually no museums and actually just everything digital. I'm sure that would be a lot better, but I'm not sure. I can't say that. We probably shouldn't even include that. I'm just trying to think of, of, of what the world would look like and, and what the most energy efficient way to live would be if we still had kind of all of our modern sensibilities. I try to analyze these things in my daily life, but sometimes it gets to be too overwhelming for me <laughs> to try to be the most sustainable that I can be. So we are going to about wrap it up here. Um, final thoughts, Ryan, do you think that NFTs are going to last into the future? Do you think it's the next big thing for anything from video games to the art world to albums? Are you maybe one day gonna be eating your words and buying some NFTs? Um, I think so, yes. I think anything that promotes exclusivity and just flex, I think will always kind of push forward, even if it's not directly buying NFT artworks, but more like buying up land in Minecraft, like with that one game that kind of looks similar, uh, or buying uh, cards, like actual good, honest to goodness trading cards. Um, I'm not sure if this art thing will uh, stick around, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I think more than likely, we're just gonna get more and more with something like this. Even if it's not NFTs, it's gonna be something that is a digital something <laughs> that people are gonna be able to buy. Um, I will say that there is like a problem with NFTs, like they're not like unsusceptible from anything happening to them. Um, like there is such a thing as like bit rot, um, JPEGs can deteriorate, file formats can't be open anymore, people lose their passwords <laughs> to be able to open their NFTs. Um, so it's not like they can just last forever, just like real physical artworks cannot last forever either. Um, but even with that, I think they will probably just continue in the future. I personally would be interested in learning more about the NFT market to see like maybe as an artist, like what I could maybe do with it one day. Um, but yeah, I, I think it'll probably keep going in time. All right, everybody. So thank you so much for being with us today and learning about NFTs. Next week, we are going to be having a special for Ryan's birthday. So 
If you want to wish Ryan a happy birthday, you better make sure that you're here with us. Shout out to our <laughs> patrons on Patreon. Yes, we do have a Patreon. Um, so go ahead and click over there. Uh, we're really working on stuff over there. I'm going to be out of school soon. So we're going to try to get some extra content up on there soon. Um, and we really appreciate your support and it motivates us to keep going. So thanks so much again for that. Thank you, patrons. And if you haven't already, make sure you like and subscribe. Review us on Apple Podcasts. Give us a rating. Share us with your friends. We'd love to have more people in our Prickly Pear community who want to talk pop culture and politics with us. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>